Welcome to Why I Quit, the show that interviews people quitting their nine to five jobs in search of something different. Listen to inspiring conversations where we dive deep into the stories of why people quit their jobs. What were the hardest parts? Where are they now? And any advice for people following the same path? I'm so excited to introduce you to today's guest, Caitlin Magnuson. Listen as we dive into how she took her experiences and skills from her previous jobs to build a company that she would want to work for. Learn how Caitlin is changing the corporate norms and expectations for her employees while growing her company, The Freelance CFO. Get inspired by her mission to change the work week. I just wanted to start off a little bit. If you can kind of give me like a brief background in terms of your job history from after school. Yeah, absolutely. So I feel like I am the quintessential entrepreneur with ADHD um, as far as my corporate work history goes. So I graduated in 2011. Wow. Yeah. Graduated in 2011. Um, had been working an office job, you know, doing bookkeeping, finances, all of that, but really was sort of stunted as to where I could, you know, go from there. Um, ended up working in, well, I ended up working at a company that did uh, legal sales tax um, library build outs for companies. So like in the medical fields, things like that, because a lot of companies will bill uh, sales tax and pay sales tax on everything when they really don't have to be. And so the company I worked for, we were able to basically create libraries that said, if you sell this product in this way, you don't need to be doing that. And then we could audit and, you know, get money back for them and take a portion. And that was great. It was exhausting. It was really long hours. It was really crappy pay. Um, better than where I was, but still really crappy pay. And a bunch of us jumped ship and went from there to Thomson Reuters eight months after I started working there, I think. Um, at two similar area, but we were actually handling the sales tax rates. So calling all the jurisdictions, doing all that. So getting really familiar and very comfortable, um, uh, with chatting with, you know, local municipalities, things of that nature. And then ended up back in the small business realm, got poached from someone that I had worked with during college and ended up doing everything. So working as a controller, production manager, um, for a small equestrian apparel company. And helped prep them to sell, which was a great learning experience. But sadly, they sold after two years of me being there. And then I went with the new owners for a little bit and was thrown into unemployment in 2015, which is terrifying uh, as the primary earner. And Oregon Unemployment at the time and said, hey, you're 25. We don't think you're going to find a job that you know pays what you've been making based on your industry. And I was like, great. Um, so they were like, we recommend you start your own business. And I'd already been freelancing on the side doing, you know, bookkeeping and finance, but that was really the big jump. Um, or should I say push to an extent? Um, I was like, well, might as well. And then basically I didn't have to do anything for unemployment so long as I was working on my business. And it was great. Um, built a successful business at the time, wasn't six figures, but it still replaced, you know, what I needed and ended up coming on full time with a client there working in the apparel industry. Again, it's kind of my my vice. Um, and then that was, that was great for two years and then went back out on my own. I was able to sort of finagle my business, how I wanted it to be. You know, we all, I think go through those learning scenarios where you take on a client that maybe you shouldn't have, or you don't stand firm in what your rates are. And so being able to clean house and really know where I wanted to be, um, is what I did during that time. And then I took, uh, I think a year later, a job strategically to help me qualify for a house. Um, working in work comp and payroll because, I mean, you know, being self-employed, uh, qualifying for a home mortgage could be a little bit of a difficulty, we'll say. Um, and I knew that we were going to be looking to buy. And so I took it strategically, A, to increase my skill set. Um, again, take a little bit of a break, sort of revamp what I was doing. We were, you know, rolling out a lot of offers at that time. And we parted ways last year, right when the pandemic started. And I don't plan to go back. Um, part of the reason I'd taken that last job outside of qualifying was it made my husband feel better or safer. Um, it does not make me feel safer. It makes me feel suffocated to be in it. And it was a really flexible work environment. Like I worked remotely. It was great. It was every, they met every demand that I had to come work for them and it was still suffocating. So that's where I am now, uh, working for myself. We have four employees soon to be five. Um, we've grown, you know, three times over last year and are just, I mean, killing it. I could not be happier and helping so many people. Thank you for uh, that background. And it's, it's funny. I, I like, I know your 
kind of your story and your history from your business side of it, but it's also really interesting kind of hearing, you know, your progression to get there. And so I, I think I want to like go back a little bit and kind of get an understanding. And it, and it seems like a lot of what you were doing was gaining experience from your other jobs that you're now implementing into your current business. And like, how, how important do you think that was as part of that process for you? Incredibly. Um, and it actually makes it a little bit difficult to find people to fill some of our roles at times because we're not looking for someone that's been siloed, you know, in an accounts payable department. I, after my second job, I started looking at job hopping as exa- exactly that, a way to get paid to learn additional skill sets that were complementary. So I have a really deep understanding of work comp, of payroll taxes, of garnishments, of all the things that already complemented my bookkeeping, accounting, and finance knowledge. And I think it was absolutely invaluable for being able to position me for where I am and to also understand the breadth that needs to be covered for small business owners because we we don't need, and I hate, I hate the term small business, um, non, non, you know, corporate entities, um, because you don't need a full-time person doing each of these roles, but you also don't necessarily know how to navigate all of them. And being able to job hop really allowed me to learn how to navigate a lot of that. You're doing everything right from accounting to legal, to sales, to invoicing, to everything. So it's a matter of like, you know, how much experience do you have and how how much of that experience can you leverage into that versus how much you need to figure out? Because that level of like figuring out like takes time and there's yes. a learning curve. So it sounds like almost when you were thinking about your jobs, you were also thinking about not just like the money aspect, but also like what job is going to set me up better to have a new skill set that I could use down the road. Was the Was the ultimate goal to always have your own business that you were going to run? Yeah, that was always my ultimate goal. Um, there, you know, there were some discussions had at home um, out of out of some fear, I think. Um, but yeah, we I always wanted to have my own business. There was just a little bit of wheel, not wheeling and dealing, but there there was a little bit of negotiation to be had. But yes, we're now at the point where um, I don't think that that is a discussion point in our household anymore. I will be continuing with my business. Like how many hours were you averaging? You know, per week, per month, and like. What, what did that look like for you at, the, at that time at those like different accounting jobs you had? Yeah, yeah. No, so at that very first one that I was able to sort of dip my toe into outside of college, we were expected to work 12 to 16 hour days for $27,000 a year in 2012. So not that long. Ago. And I got to the point, I actually met my now husband while I was working there, got divorced, met my husband. It was, it was a very transitional job. Um, and decided that I didn't like working more than nine or 10 hours a day there when I was able to get everything done. And so I just started leaving. Um, at four o'clock, I was done for the day and I, I was done. I was done, done at that point. Um, but I was already actively interviewing other places. So that was the worst. I mean, they just, they really expected, um, you to be there and to have nothing outside of that. And my next job with Thompson Reuters was actually my first introduction into more of a flexible work schedule. Um, they expected, you know, 40 plus hours a week, but the job was not a 40 plus hour a week job. There was one week a month where it was, it was maybe 45. The rest of the time they wanted, you know, ass and seat, but they started letting us go remote and they had flex hours. So I only had to be there from nine to three. If I got in there before anyone else got in there, I could leave at three, even if I did, you know, seven hours or seven and a half hours. And I'm a morning person. So that worked great. And I was getting everything done. And so that was it was a very interesting way to be like, oh, I don't, I don't actually have to be here and I can still get it all done. So then I started easing into it. And then when I jumped into the other business, the smaller company, my hours were much more reasonable. We would have month end close and that was really busy. Um, but outside of that, I was probably doing 45 hours a week. And then, so I, I flexed. And then when I jumped ship again and had my own business, I worked a lot more hours when I had my own business. Yeah. Um, it's taken a lot. You, you probably feel this sometimes, but it's taken a lot to not work as many hours as I do, uh, especially during the pandemic, because there wasn't really much else to do. So why not work, um, especially when it's snowy or crappy? So I, I've worked as many as 16 or 17 hours a day during tax season, especially when I had a job plus my business. But I am now down to five to six hours on a good day. Especially on the services side. I think something that is like really hard that I've had to deal with is like, you know, when all of your hours are billable or the majority of your hours are billable, like if you're not working, you're de- directly taking revenue away from yourself. And I think that's like really hard to 
deal with. And I think like, what, what are some of the things that you've been able to do? Cause I think like one thing that I've always like, you know, like really admired about the way that you like run your business is like, you're like, Hey, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or these are going to be the days that I am going to work. You set your expectations up front with your clients and then you, you know, you're able to just, you know, kind of stick to that schedule and you've like created this like work-life balance. Like talk to me a little bit about what it took to get there. And then also kind of like, what are some of the challenges you deal with that as well? It took complete and utter exhaustion and frustration. I think to get to that point, I tend to be really hard headed. Um, and for me, it was divesting myself from the hourly. So for the most part, I don't do hourly. I mean, I do some consult calls that are really limited. My bread and butter is based on retainer work. And so I'm able in general to be really efficient. And so I'm not being penalized for, you know, working efficiently. And it gives me the incentive to do what I do, do it well and be done. And being able to show value for what I bill has been a big game changer. And there are things, you know, I I quote project rates instead of quoting hourly because I hate tracking my time. I really do. I'm horrible at it. I ended up always undercutting my time because I forget to start a time tracker or I forget to put it in there and I don't want to overbill the client. And so then you're negotiating against yourself. That's the thing that we always end up doing is we're like, are we charging too much? And then, you know, it's just, it's always a battle. Yes, no, exactly. So yeah, my, my biggest thing was basically just getting so exhausted doing an hourly basis, realizing that a lot of times clients don't love that anyways. I mean, I don't like, I work on retainer with a lot of my, you know, contractors that I work with because I want a fixed idea of where we're at for the month. And if the scope changes, of course we can, you know, discuss that at that time, but I don't care if it takes you three hours or 12 hours. So long as like the rate we've you know negotiated is what we both feel is fair, go forth. And so I've taken that a lot into my side of the business and have found that to be really beneficial in preventing burnout. You know, now, especially from like a hybrid workforce and things changing, it feels like people are like, oh, wait, because I'm not commuting, because I'm not like having these like random office conversations, like I'm able to get done like what I was able to in eight hours and now like four to six. Have you seen any pushback from clients in terms of like your schedule or is it a matter of setting expectations? How does that work for you? So we we did have a little bit of pushback occasionally and what it came down to was those clients weren't aligned for who where we were going. Yeah. And it was really few and far between. Like I'm talking maybe less than 10%. A lot of our clients were like, you know what? Good for you. That's awesome. And some of them have implemented similar things in their own business. You know, they only work days that their kids are in school or they only, you know, they, they flex their hours for the summer, whatever works for them. But I have found that setting expectations up front, letting them know, you know, this is how you communicate. This is, if, if it's a true emergency, here you go. But we, we're not surgeons. You know, we're, we're not dealing with life and death. And outside of tax deadlines, which I'm available for, generally there's a couple day flex, you know, and I make that really clear. I'm not saying your problem's not important. However, it will still be there in 24 hours and I am happy to hop in there. And so I think some of that is reassuring them that like accountants, I think, get a bad rap. We have a lot of people that will come to us and say, hey, I haven't heard from so-and-so in three months and I've reached out to them four times. Like, I just don't feel like I'm important. And so being able to validate that, no, you are important, but we're also, we don't take unscheduled calls. You know, this is how you can reach out to us and we will happily be available during this time allows them to just go, oh, okay, I'm good with that. But it's just setting that, you know, the ground rules that allows them to feel so much more, I think, at ease with how we work. Do you have times where you need to let clients go because they don't fit in with the the system that you're trying to you know, build within your company? Yes, very rarely. So we, our biggest growing pain this year has been learning how to not just have me in the picture, you know, bringing the team members on and not only having them behind the scenes, but having them interface with clients. We have grown so much that I don't do all of the work, which is really interesting. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's been more on me adjusting than our clients adjusting. Most of our clients have been like, I don't care. I trust your judgment, whoever you bring on. Like, I trust that you vetted them and that you're doing the right thing because I'm, I'm trusting your judgment in this whole process. That's why we're here. And there have been, there's one, um, actually that was like, oh, well, I'm really, you know, I'm not comfortable working with someone else. And I said, okay, that's, you know, I understand that. However, you know, we'll finish out your contract term and we can discuss it because we're we're offering different price points. So we rolled out different service offerings at the same time that we rolled out other changes. So that way they didn't feel like they were getting less for more, if that makes sense. And I think that made the transition a lot more smooth. As you are scaling your team, I think uh, 
it was cool to see. I saw you, you went viral on TikTok. I think that one video had over a million views or something right. crazy like that. Then now, yeah, it keeps going like viral every week after, and yeah, it's insane. And so the the concept of that video was based around really around like the the thirty hour work week and some of these practices that you are um, building within your business and with the employees coming in. Talk to me a little bit about like one why you think that video went viral, and two kind of how has that process been of like bringing in employees in a system that isn't typically the norm. Yeah. So it's, it's a work in progress. And the ironic thing is after going viral, we have been struggling to keep our hours under that because there has been, you know, inboxes were overflowing our newsletter, our Facebook group, like everything just went and we have team members, but we weren't ramped up yet. You know, this is our off season. We start getting busy in October. We're all kind of chilling. Part-time people are vacationing. I just come back from vacation and I was like, oh, dear God, like at least it's not tax season. Um, but it feels very much like that. And so for us, I had never planned to have employees ever. Um, I didn't want to go through the hassle of, you know, payroll. And everything. But then I, I got to the point where I had to do it for myself, for the S-Corp. And if I was going to do it for myself then I might as well look at an executive assistant because I live in the middle of nowhere and we need things mailed from in town and it would be a lot easier than that kind of snowball. Cause that was in January and I wanted to build, I was actually talking with my, I have a performance coach I work with and I was like, you know, if I build this, I want to build somewhere that I would want to work. What did I love about that last job that I was at and what would I change? And some of the biggest things were, it was completely remote. I was allowed autonomy and to own what I needed and I was paid well. And my particular manager didn't care if I worked 25 hours a week or if I worked 40 hours a week, so long as things got done. The problem was he started to, as I performed well, I ended up with more and more and more on my plate until I could no longer keep my hours where they needed to be. And I was making less than when I started once you factored everything in. So we've set some really clear either revenue-based goals and or client number goals. But the goal here is 25 to 30 hours a week. I think Alicia clocked 35 last week and we're, we've reshuffled things for this week. But she is tracking her time and so is our other gal to make sure that they're not going over because so many of us are conditioned to just go, go, go. And the work is there. We could work for 50 hours a week, but it's not healthy. And, you know, we want to be doing things outside of it and encouraging ourselves to do things outside of work. And so holding ourselves accountable, holding myself accountable, and then allowing not allowing, encouraging the flexible work schedule. You know, I don't, I don't care what days of the week they work. Our clients are self-employed. So they work weird hours, nights, weekends. Like we don't have to hold a nine to five. And someone had asked on TikTok, like, well, what do you do when someone calls the office? No one calls the office. We don't do unscheduled calls. You know, we have Voxer, we have email, like we have ways for people to contact us and we have a scheduling link. You know, it's just me here. Everyone else, like we have Alicia's in Indiana. We have people in Oregon. We have people down in Boise. Like it just, it doesn't have to be that way because you don't have to be sitting waiting for someone to call. And even when I worked in an office environment, we would forward our calls to our cell phone and then you could be wherever you needed to be doing what you needed to do. So it's been, it's been evolving because I want, we're offering performance coaching reimbursement just for like overall flow for the employees that work with us. Full-time salaries, um, starting salary is at 70000 for full-time people. And our part-timers are between 20 and 25 an hour. We're working on bumping that. And part-time is under 20 hours a week right now. But full PPO, you know, three weeks a year, like unlimited sick time. There's no reason. If you're sick, like, don't work for the day. I, I don't, I, I'm over, you know, infantilizing people that, like, if I'm hiring you, it's because I have faith in your ability to do the job. Because that's why you're here. So it, it's really just looking at people as being autonomous, responsible human beings and trusting them to do what they've been brought on. And also having an honest dialogue. You know, we chat weekly about, hey, is anyone feeling overloaded? Is anyone, you know, needing to shuffle things around? Where where are we at? What do we need to do differently? And do we need additional help? I love how you're starting to build this based on the the things that you didn't like about your uh, corporate job and you know something I definitely want to wrap up with is really kind of this understanding of like I think there's so many people out there who are in jobs they don't particularly like but they don't know where to start where to go what to do what's some piece of, of advice that you've taken 
So one of the best things that I ever did, and I, I don't know how much of this, you know, you run into, but being a woman negotiating is not terribly common um, in corporate careers. And that was something that I did away with. And the idea of, just bear with me, but the idea of loyalty to a company, um, someone had told me a small business owner actually had told me they're not going to like, they won't hesitate to cut you for their bottom line. Why would you not do the same thing if you could find something better? And so I very much looked at job hopping as I, I left with glowing reviews everywhere that I left, you know, there was, I, there was nothing wrong. I wasn't fired, but I would absolutely always be looking for either a better work environment and or better pay. I moved once for lateral pay, but a better work environment. Every other time I went from $27,000 to just shy of $100,000 in five years by job hopping and a much better working environment. And so I think if you're able to do that while you're in corporate, it allows you additional bandwidth to then work on building a business if that's what you're inclined to be doing. And I think that that is really helpful to take so much of the pressure off of you to perform or to take on clients that aren't aligned because We've all done it out of necessity or, you know, lack of understanding of how we work and being able to drop a client that's misaligned is one of the, I think, most freeing things I have ever experienced. And I was able to do that because I had additional, you know, income sources at the time. You're always nervous before you do it, but then after you do it, you're always so relieved. And yeah, yeah. And I think, uh, I think it's funny. It's like everyone puts so much pressure on themselves um, instead of just doing it. I think something that I, you know, you were talking about is you work part-time on your business on the side, like while building that up. How do you know when to officially make the jump? And what was there like a specific moment for you that did it? I was done three months before I was done. Um, I hit the point where I was at the peak of my position, highest paid, youngest person in the role, you know, going everywhere to train people on things, spearheading all these projects. I was miserable. It was so much more work than I was doing. I'd only gotten a $10,000 raise, which was still huge to advocate for. And my business was continuing to grow and it was no longer able to grow because I was the bottleneck. I did not have additional hours available and I was resenting my day job. And so I put it out there, depending on how, you know, wooey you are, I put it out there that like, yeah, you know, I wouldn't be heartbroken if I was fired or laid off. And like, I started talking about it and talking about it, but my husband was so not comfortable with me leaving because I was then making two and a half times what he was making at that time. And we just bought a house and he was, you know, it had served its purpose. You know, we bought the house that I'd taken it to qualify for. So I was like done coming into tax season, like very available to be laid off. And sure as shit come, you know, COVID a week before I'd been told my job was secure. And then I was given two days notice that I was done actually on my anniversary date, which means I got severance and I got all of my new PTO. So I was really happy with that because I ended up with six weeks of pay and I qualified for unemployment, which was, I was putting it out there basically that I was done. And I knew I was done because the business couldn't grow anymore. Even though the numbers didn't support me leaving, I knew that I had enough buffer for about three months if I didn't want to touch anything. And I could have touched retirement or other things if I had to, but I always felt comfortable betting on myself. And it could not have been, it was a little bit of like a, whew. and then the next month, I mean, the business just exploded because I had all of this capacity and mental bandwidth. I think the bandwidth is so key because especially when people are working part-time, you know, there's, there's only so many hours in the day. And I think like everyone always overestimates what they think they can do for working a full-time job and on the side with it. But on the, on the flip side of the coin too, it's so important to build up savings and kind of build up the security blanket, because I think like what doesn't get talked about is like how hard it is in the beginning, right? And how much time it takes. And I think the majority of people that are quitting their jobs are leaving because, you know, they want to, travel more, you know, they're looking for more financial freedom, you know, they want to create their own schedule. But in all reality, what typically happens the first like year or two, you don't go on vacation because you don't have a stable salary, you're working more hours than you were before. And you have like more stress because like, it everything is on you. Yes. Something that bothers me is the, the lack of understanding and the lack of communication of 
what it's really like to quit your job and start your own business versus like all of the get rich quick schemes out yeah. there. Like, you know, like what, what do you see when it turn, when it comes to that? I see the people that are like, I did e-commerce drop shipping and like, now I make, you know, $80,000 a month. I'm like, okay, that's great. But also how many of these are the outliers? And, you know, did you show the 70 or 80 hour work weeks that you probably did when you were getting going to learn all of this, to do it all, to be a one person show? You know, did you take a loan out to get started, which I'm actually not against doing if it's giving you the buffer, you know, in the, the breathing space, but there is so much. And I did so much of that for me while I was working other jobs. I worked probably three years off and on of running the business and other jobs to just feel confident a in what I was doing and B that I had a model that would work and that would be sustainable. And it took shifts. And that's the thing is like, I think we do so many pivots in the first like two to five years as business owners that, you know, you're, you're still learning, like, how do you best work? How do your clients work? What works for you? Like what works in the industry and the market. And once you're able to nail that down, everything kind of shifts a little bit again. And, you know, you need to pivot with that. And so being able to keep up with the pivots, I think is something that people don't think about when they're like, oh yeah, I'm going to leave my job. It'll be great. Yeah. But you also have health insurance and retirement and like, and it's all solvable, but like you have to factor that in. You need to make about double, I would say what you think you actually need in order to be able to cover those things. I I definitely just want to thank you for your time. It's been a cool to hear a lot about your journey and where you are now. And I guess for, uh, you know, people that want to learn more about what you do or are interested in your services, you, you want to just give kind of a yeah. quick um, information on how people can find you? We will have a brand new website up, I think at the end of the week. So it'll be caitlinmagnuson.com and Instagram is where I live the most. And that is at Caitlin period Magnuson. I think it might be Caitlin Magnuson with no period. I should really know that, but those are really the two main places that I live and you're able to see service offerings, courses, you know, get a fill for me, reach out, chat, and that's, I'll just be doing my thing, you know, changing the work week. Thank you for listening. It really means a lot to us. We want to hear from you as we keep growing. Please reach out on whyiquit.co with any feedback or if you have any guests you think would be a good fit. Also, a special thanks to Chris Dole for the music. Check out his new album, Here's to You, on Spotify. Thank you, and we will be back next week with another episode.